So uh, as we heard earlier, uh, broadcast had a set of, traditionally has had a set of public interest obligations associated with it um, as a result of uh, what uh, I think it was Kevin and a number of others have pointed out were kind of a historic accident um, that uh, uh, when, uh, um, you know, it, when we were setting these systems up, uh, initially, um, the technology was capable of certain things, and uh, um, the way the uh, economics of it work enabled certain kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, things like news gathering. The uh, technology encouraged uh, a focus on the local community uh, and uh, also on an idea of one licensee uh, acting as the... Um, uh, acting as the uh, uh, proprietor, if you will, of the uh, spectrum access um, and having in exchange for this use of the public airwaves uh, a, uh, an obligation uh, to serve uh, the local community. In uh, uh, the uh, mobile wireless, we had a, a somewhat different vision. I point out the statute requires all licenses, whether they're for cell phones, uh, or mobile uh, broadband, or uh, for television broadcasting, all of them uh, are supposed to be issued by the FCC only uh, if they are found to serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have had uh, public interest obligations associated with uh, mobile, uh, first mobile telephony, now we speak more broadly of mobile broadband. Um, the uh, uh, those tended to be also, because of the historic nature of the service, it was a voice service, it was a common carrier service, um, uh, the ones we traditionally associated with common carrier rather than the ones we associated with broadcast. So there were never any content obligations uh, on wireless carriers uh, because, of course, you know, carrier, wireless carriers didn't do content. They were helping people talk on the phone. But we did have universal service, um, and uh, we, uh, particularly with an emphasis on the service uh, to rural communities, and then again uh, in 1993 when we started to get serious about this with an idea uh, of uh, using this technology um, to uh, encourage um, the uh, economic development of women-owned businesses and uh, uh, communities of color. Um, and uh, we also had a public safety uh, idea inherent in this, both as a direct uh, allocation of uh, uh, wireless as a set aside for public safety instead of having, say, public broadcasting. Uh, we had a, uh, an idea that we need to have this mobile voice for public safety. Uh, and we've seen that that, uh, as a public interest obligation, uh, is also now sort of tied up in our management of spectrum. And then we had this thing totally out of the blue that didn't fit any of the paradigm, which was this unlicensed uh, access, uh, which uh, you know started uh, uh, initially um, as uh, uh, a way to do garage openers and uh, um, other kind of very low power uh, 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 services that nobody thought of as um, you know potentially amounting to much. And now we uh, have seen that unlicensed as well as uh, licensed use of bro of the uh, wireless spectrum. Uh, has tremendous uh, potential, um, and we have a question, you know, do, do public interest obligations somehow come with unlicensed? Is unlicensed itself the public interest uh, because it gives everybody access, so we can kind of do away with the whole notion that we need a separate uh, uh, public interest obligation, perhaps? Or alternatively, uh, is there something in all of this that we're missing um, that uh, now, as these uh, services come to the fore, we really ought to be thinking about. So let me uh, start to put this out uh, to our panelists. Um, uh, I'll introduce people as I, uh, uh, as I call on them. I will mention, uh, uh, let me start with uh, Amina Fazlulo, who is with Benton Foundation. Benton, of course, has done a lot to straddle um, the, uh, the two worlds of traditional broadcasting and uh, uh, the new world of new media and digital divide. Um, I know you guys have been very active in the Lifeline Linkup Reform and Universal Service Fund. Um, could you uh, uh, speak a little bit about, from your perspective, 
uh, how you see these two worlds perhaps blending um, and uh, what uh, uh, this idea that a, uh, uh, a license from the FCC is in the public interest uh, ought to mean as we uh, move forward. Sure. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, as Harold said, I'm policy counsel with the Benton Foundation, and the Benton Foundation has focused very specifically in the past few years, and actually even beyond that, on um, how to connect um, our most vulnerable populations to the most important communications mediums of today. Um, in the, in the past year, uh, we focused a little bit more on Lifeline and LinkUp. And before I delve into universal service and sort of the connections to universal service, I think it's important to note that um, when you're speaking about unlicensed, I think unlicensed is interesting because it's actually been an area where um, we've been able to utilize unlicensed use to be able to connect um, underserved populations in a way that might have been difficult even with uh, licensed providers or with traditional wireline services. So for example, in San Francisco, they were able to um, capitalize on, on fiber that they had in the city to be able to connect public housing, um, which was a much cheaper way to wire those buildings um, and to bring access to those communities. Um, also, alternatively, it's a much cheaper way to uh, set up um, computer centers in the bottoms of those buildings if, if it doesn't make sense to wire the whole building all at once. Um, just yesterday, we held a joint conference with Connected Living to talk about connecting um, aging population seniors. And it was interesting to hear from so many of these people who are on the ground doing this work how much they actually utilized um, wireless, um, uh, unlicensed wireless, um, to be able to do that work. So it was, it's kind of interesting to see how um, as you said, unlicensed wireless might be doing some of the public interest work on its own. Um, does it make sense to put a, a, a another obligation on top of it? Um, when it comes to licensed use, um, I think that uh, Universal Service has taken a look at um, mobile and has sort of given it a nod that it's actually got sort of the, it's risen to the level of importance that I think we've um, seen traditional landline um, have and universal the universal service fund has been focused on ensuring that um, we've got telephone access throughout the country um, with this new uh, sort of update to the universal service fund programs um, what we've seen is the commission giving a nod to mobile and um, I think that's it's really interesting to see that because I think what they're saying is that um, it's it's becoming part of sort of the necessary um, or it, it's getting, uh, the necessary language is getting applied to, to mobile services. Um, and, and with that, I'll just turn back to Harold. Thanks. Let me uh, next ask Margaret McCarthy, who um, is right now uh, uh, serving uh, with uh, Representative Waxman uh, uh, as um, counsel on the, uh, uh, as committee counsel uh, uh, associated with Representative Waxman, uh, who is the ranking uh, member of the uh, House uh, Commerce Committee. Uh, prior to that, she was uh, uh, been in the Senate, uh, been uh, uh, worked in the Senate, uh, worked at the FCC, so is uh, um, intimately uh, familiar with these issues and has seen these fights uh, in all of their toxicity, uh, as we heard previously, play out. Uh, and most recently, of course, uh, with some uh, very significant spectrum legislation that was passed. And uh, one of the things um, that was interesting in that debate was we heard at least members of Congress articulate some ideas about the public interest, um, some of them related to public safety and uh, uh, interoperability, some of them uh, related to uh, uh, raising revenue for the uh, um, for the Treasury, which used to be, uh, in fact, prohibited by statute to consider for, uh, uh, as a public interest benefit, but, but that was very clearly to the fore for a number of members. Uh, and also uh, a, yeah, another new idea of innovation, that uh, um, uh, particularly uh, a number of the defenders of, the, uh, uh, of uh, unlicensed uh, in this uh, debate 
uh, pointed to the ability of, of uh, unlicensed to spur uh, experimentation and innovation. Um, and uh, that was never a, a public interest obligation that we thought about with regard uh, uh, to spectrum management previously, although it's certainly been in our lexicon a great deal. So um, could you give us uh, a little insight into uh, uh, kind of how Congress may be, uh, may be thinking about it and what guidance uh, we might want to take from uh, um, how to navigate the toxicity here? Sure. So. Um Obviously, uh, the really landmark legislation that was just enacted into law, um, you know, sort of originated with this recommendation coming out of the 9-11 Commission and, and the focus on the need for a, a nationwide interoperable public safety network. Um, but at the same time, you know, recognizing that there were great public interest benefits from also making available new wireless spectrum for commercial use. So the, the challenge is Congress, I think, historically is interested in, in these issues of spectrum policy, most often in the context of kind of deficit reduction exercises. Um, so, you know, giving the FCC auction authority is a great way to, you know, go to CBO, get some of those big billion dollar numbers uh, out of the scoring process. But, you know, when you're talking about sort of these broader societal public interest benefits, there's really no dollar sign associated with those. So I, I think the debate that Harold is alluding to and that's incredibly important is, you know, we understand there are these great benefits from innovation, you know, even great benefits to the economy, to jobs uh, in, in preserving unlicensed use. But it was, you know, I think definitely, um, you know, we needed strong advocates to be making those points as part of that process. Yeah, and of, of course, I'll, I'll also mention it wasn't just unlicensed, the idea of innovation as a public interest and job creation uh, as a public interest uh, benefit uh, were, uh, um, were raised a great deal with regard to getting out more licensed spectrum and also, interestingly enough, with regard to moving it away from the, as a justification for moving it away from broadcasters uh, to uh, wireless uh, carriers, that um, it would serve the public interest more because it would create more jobs uh, it would uh, uh, enable uh, sort of new uh, um, uh, developments. Uh, uh, let me uh, put the question to uh, uh, to Ben Lennett, uh, who is uh, with us from uh, New America, um, and uh, uh, ask. So, you know, in this debate that we just had, and, and in fairness, we'll just focus on on license for a moment. Um, you know, what do we take from this? debate of broadcast versus broadband and these new articulated theories of uh, the public interest that it's about job creation and innovation uh, as much as it may be about localism and uh, universal service. Um, well, I mean, I think that we can actually take a lot from the legacy of broadcast public interest obligations. I mean, the whole sort of uh, theory or sort of uh, kind of argument behind uh, broadcaster public interest obligations was, you know, this is a public, the spectrum itself is a, is a public good, and by giving someone an exclusive license, you are removing the free speech uh, rights of the community or anyone else that wants to speak over that spectrum, because spectrum is for all intents and purposes speech. Uh, it's a medium for speech. And so I think there's actually a rich legacy that we can take from there, and if we look at the history of broadcasting, uh, it was an open question uh, beginning in the 1920s of whether or not we'd have uh, broadcasting that was under the editorial control of broadcasters or it would be a common carrier. Uh, and so when we look going forward now where we've moved from broadcast to wireless, where you know wireless is being used as a, uh, to, to provide broadband access, um, the notion we are having sort of the same debate uh, in terms of you know, will the carriers themselves have editorial control over the content on their networks? And I think the answer is no. I think that we have seen the benefits of openness on the internet of a neutral network and its benefits for innovation and jobs, and I think clearly that's an obligation that needs to be placed on them, as well as sort of this idea, uh, again, because they are getting an enormous benefit from having access to this spectrum, not just on a shared basis, but exclusive basis, again, where no one else can use that spectrum, that there, you know, is requirements for universal service. Um, you know, there are so many cases out there of, of uh, entities coming in, purchasing spectrum, 
serving part of the community or part of this area and, you know, letting the rest of the community just lay, lay fallow. And the notion that they can just sort of sit on that spectrum without any mechanism, whether it's use it or share it, or some sort of annual spectrum fee that would at least incent them to uh, lease it out to someone else that's willing to serve that community, uh, I think is, is needs to be part of the discussion. And then in terms of you know, this licensed versus unlicensed. Um, to me, unlicensed is really, uh, it is sort of this public good, and um, I don't know that we need to transfer the same obligations, in part because if you look at who's using unlicensed and where to provide internet access. So, uh, you know, we have Wally on, who's, who's an operator in uh, uh, Asheville, North Carolina. I mean, there are so many parts of this country that if the WISPs, these wireless internet service providers, didn't have access to unlicensed, those areas would not have internet access. I mean, the incumbents have completely ignored them, both wired and wireless. And so it's an enormous public benefit that we continue to increase the amount of unlicensed access because it's a huge uh, benefit to not have to purchase spectrum at auction. I mean, how many, how many new entrepreneurs have, uh, you know, what is what? What did uh, Verizon spent three point nine billion dollars on the C block? <coughs> How many new innovators or new entrepreneurs or local communities have three point nine billion dollars to go buy Spectrum to provide service? So, I think you know it's fine to talk about jobs and innovation, but it's a it's a bigger picture than just the carriers. And yes, the carriers have done tremendous amount of innovation, and we have wonderful devices in our in our in our in our pockets right now and they do create jobs but th there's also jobs that are being created as part of unlicensed i mean all of the innovation that wi-fi offers in part because there are no barriers to entry it, for the most part and it, and it opens up a lot of doors that otherwise would be closed um, given just the enormous uh, upfront cost for for capital to purchase spectrum yes and, and i just can't help but chime in that one of the things that i i felt was unfortunate about uh, Larry's uh, uh, remarks, a little ironic in light of his uh, um, admonition to move away from old fights, was it really did feel that we were moving away from this licensed versus unlicensed, that uh, we have carriers now who are incorporating uh, unlicensed uh, you know, into their uh, networks. We have cable operators who are offering uh, um, a uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, roaming. Uh, but let me, you mentioned Wally. Wally, are you there with us? Here, can you hear me? Yes, let me let me ask you. One of the things we talked about on the earlier panel was this idea of localism, um, right. and in wireless, in particular, uh, for rural, um, localism and uh, universal service seem to blend a great deal. Um, that, uh, um, and I'd like to, I guess, ask you two questions. Which is one: um, What's your experience? Uh, you know, again, uh, following Larry's advice that we look outside of Washington for wisdom. You're in one of the most rural areas. Uh, and hard to serve areas of the country. Um, and uh, what's your experience uh, you know, uh, uh, as somebody uh, out there uh, where carriers fear to tread? Uh, and uh, second, uh, looking at sort of this question of localism as a content issue, how has uh, the work that you've been doing with your uh, uh, organization been helping to enable uh, these communities not just to uh, connect um, to the internet so that they can stream Netflix, but you know, how has it uh, uh, helped them with this concept of actually developing their own local voices and local content? Right. Um, well, the first question, um, our experience has been exhilarating and extremely frustrating simultaneously. Um, to have access to the unlicensed spectrum, the unlicensed technologies we now have, We've been able to reach some of these hard to reach areas, but um, you know we're using what the engineers back in the 80s called the junk bands. Uh, they called it junk because no one it didn't seem to have any use, and then all of a sudden, um, all all these new Wi-Fi technologies and garage door openers that you were referring to uh, exploded on the scene. But it's still not the most efficient spectrum, so. We will typically, um, we will hook up someone in February who is just insistent that we bring service to them. And then when the trees leap out in the summer, um, you know, they're having real difficulty uh, getting a good broadband connection because the, the spectrum that we have access to 
won't penetrate that heavy foliage. Uh, it won't bend around mountain ridges. It won't penetrate buildings. So uh, we've been able to make great progress using this very limited spectrum. But um, what's exciting is what we could do if there were uh, a more efficient unlicensed spectrum made available. And I want to add that uh, <laughs> the other benefit of being in a rural area is that we're some distance from Washington. So we have a little different perspective and and um, um, it, what, what's exciting is that I think we're at a point where we have the opportunity to look at spectrum as infrastructure and as the uh, part of the commons and you know we hear, hear all this uh, dialogue about the power of private markets and market driven policies etc but I think we've forgotten the fact that the power of markets, is derived from some underlying commons infrastructure, whether it's the rivers or the roads or the legal system or the post office uh, or the internet. Um, um, you know, there's a common power of private markets. And so what I hope we have moving forward is a, a growing recognition that uh, in the case of spectrum, We've been far too um, um, reluctant to open up spectrum as a commons and therefore unleash the power of markets. And right here, in, you know, we can build and operate our own networks, which keeps jobs local, which keeps money in the local economy, which builds social capital. All of that's possible now, but our policies are stuck in the 20th century. And so um, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Let me uh, uh, turn now to uh, uh, Amalia Deloney, who is uh, with us from the Center for Media Justice. And uh, uh, Amalia also does her work uh, primarily outside of uh, Washington, D.C., um, uh, organizing uh, folks in communities, um, both uh, uh, urban and rural, um, listening you know, a lot to what uh, people have to say. Um, and uh, my question uh, uh, is, uh, we actually had in the statute that one of the benefits that was supposed to happen from auctioning uh, licenses was that um, we were going to get this stuff out to uh, communities that traditionally had not had an opportunity in the broadcast era. Um, to have uh, licenses. There are specific provisions about um, uh, the FCC should try to structure it so that communities of, uh, uh, of color and women-owned businesses uh, are able to uh, uh, have both uh, uh, have access to licenses and uh, access to the benefits of the technology uh, as wireless has become uh, uh, more prevalent. And certainly, uh, uh, you know, Larry at the beginning was making a point that for a lot of people in communities of color, it's um, it's the mobile phone and not the landline uh, or uh, necessarily the uh, uh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, hotspot that is at the moment at least providing a lot of people uh, uh, with service in these communities. What's your perspective? Do you think that uh, um, how are you seeing things playing out on the ground and uh, uh, what do you think um, we ought to be uh, doing as we're considering the public interest um, uh, that uh, we haven't done given that uh, we, we did embed this in the statute uh, when we started? Uh, great question, and there's already sort of a lot of rich material on the table to highlight, and then I'll sort of add, add another piece. Um, stepping back for a second, I think, from the language of things like interoperability and spectrum and incentivizing and megahertz, um, I think that when you're talking about this issue in communities, particularly outside of the Beltway, but also in communities um, where they don't approach this from an engineering or technology or policy or legal stand, the question is really one of access um, and right to communicate. And so we work in communities all across the country. Uh, we manage a network called the Media Action Grassroots Network. Um, we have chapters really all over the country. And we work primarily in communities of color and with America's poor. And I think um, 
there's a couple points I want to make. One, I think this idea of connectivity and getting everybody um, on, you know, onto a platform that really, as I think Amina said, is one of the most powerful of our time is crucial. You know, this is the communications backbone, not just for this country, but for the world. And contrary to what I often hear, which is that people who don't have access don't actually know what they're missing or um, don't know the benefits that are out there, I think it's exactly the opposite. I think that what we hear from people all across the country every single day is that they know exactly what they're missing. When they cannot afford the access, or when, they, when it's not affordable, when they don't have an access point, when they don't have the technology and the tools, and they don't have the digital literacy to know how to utilize all of that, um, I think, in fact, it makes the loss that much more profound. Because in real time, they actually know that they're missing those pieces, and they're seeing what it's providing for other people. And so it's this double whammy in terms of feeling like really left out or really on the wrong side of the digital divide. Uh, I think also um, Harold brings up this interesting point and certainly a narrative that I hear circulating around the role that Wi-Fi has played um, and mobile phones in particular for communities of color. And there's no doubt um, if you look at the statistics, and I think they've been updated, but previously it was like 16% of English-speaking Latinos and 18% of blacks um, access the internet exclusively through their mobile devices. And I, again, I think Pew updated those stats. What I think gets left out, or so there's two parts to the story. One, I think the narrative that's put forward is like, look at the amazing things that communities of color um, are doing as they leapfrog over wired internet and go straight to wireless. And, and I think that's the challenging narrative, right? Because it implies that there's this degree of choice. And choice implies that there's a series of opportunities and you have both the self-sufficiency and the autonomy and the political and economic power to navigate and make that choice. And I would say, myself and my own family included, that is not the experience. Choosing wireless as a way to get on the internet is one of necessity. You know, and it does speak, I think, to brilliance. It does speak to resiliency. It does speak to capability in communities. But it also speaks to a choice that you're made, you're making based on a limited range of opportunities that are largely driven by the things that we're talking about today, access, affordability, digital literacy. So I just want to sort of hold that piece and not kind of perpetuate this myth of, um, of leapfrogging and instead use it as a point of entry into this larger conversation, which I think, you know, Spectrum gets us into, which is really when we say public interest obligations, who is the public we're talking about? And I think that this is 2012. We're going into a hotly contested um, election year. So it's true this year, it's especially true this year, but it's true in general that we're in the midst of profound change in this country. You know, the demographic population is shifting. It's going to be tremendously different by 20, um, 2040, or 20, yeah, 2040. The age of people is changing. We're experiencing a time when the racial wealth gap has never been greater. You can't have a conversation about public interest obligations without also holding a conversation about the economic and racial realities of this country and the systemic inequity that both predated broadcast, continued through broadcast, and now we're feeling in more profound ways now. Um, and I don't want to sound disparaging. I think, in fact, it's the opposite. It, pre it presents an opportunity I think to build a wider tent and to reach a very different audience if in fact people in this room could begin to develop a narrative that talked about public interest obligation, that talked about spectrum, that talked about all of these things and connected it to the real material concerns that people all across the justice sector deal with every day. Housing, public safety, education, full employment. These are the kinds of things that resonate with people. Not so much does, you know, does Spectrum help your garage door opener, because that implies that one, you have a house, and two, you have a car, right? You know, that, that's a difficult place to start a conversation with a lot of people, versus how can we help your child graduate from high school? How can we ensure that you're not working two or three shift jobs? How can we ensure that when the tornado comes to your community or the 35W bridge collapses in Minnesota, you know where your family is and you know they're safe. That's a very different kind of conversation and I think pulls in a much wider um, group of people. Yeah, and, and you raised so many interesting points that we need to, to think about. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, key off on a, uh, ask a couple of questions that are based on, on what you just said. But one of them that I'd like to, to put out uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the panel here is this very interesting question of, there's benefits of wireless and there's benefits of broadband. 
Um, and we've talked about um, public interest obligations traditionally have been associated with the benefits of having this exclusive access to the wireless licenses, whereas um, broadband, to the extent we've talked about this at all, was kind of like common carrier in the sense of there seems to be the social contract that, um, you know, I'm not going to say it, it is a public utility, but we, we've thought of it as being beneficial to the country like electricity uh, or water or any of these other uh, traditional uh, utilities. Um, how much do you think the theory that wireless itself, uh, especially licensed wireless, this notion of an exclusive um, uh, access, uh, and particularly in an age when uh, uh, people are now uh, uh, you know, paying back the public uh, at auction um, for this, uh, is this concept of a unique public interest uh, obligation, does that still have meaning, or um, did you pay it off when you paid your, when you wrote your check, and then whatever else follows follows because broadband is important, not because it's a wireless license. Uh, and let me uh, um, you know let me just uh, uh, start with Amaya uh, down here, and then uh, if I if uh, folk, other folks want to chime in, uh, please do. Oh my goodness! Maybe you could start on the other oh, end. I'm let me, still right. It was a lot of questions, um, Harold, in one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 start then. Uh, I'll shift one down then, and start with with Ben, and then we'll cycle back. Um, well, I mean, I, I I you know I think I said earlier that I I thought that there was a legacy there, uh, particularly with wireless, where you are, we you know you are getting an exclusive license. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of exclusive spectrum available. You could argue that there is a scarcity rationale that still holds. Now, whether that's, uh, you know, a result of policy, outdated policy, or just, uh, you know, the practicality of, of, of the world as it is now, I mean, I think there is still a scarcity rationale. I mean, you have basically two companies, uh, AT&T and Verizon, that control 70% of the licenses that have been auctioned since the 1990s. Um, and, you know, enormous amount of power that you're putting in their hands. Uh, and as a result of that, they have an enormous privilege within society. And part of that obligation then, or part of giving back to the public, should be, I think, this idea of, you know, some sort, you know, uh, open internet or non discrimination principles on the network. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, yes, uh, many of, you know, yes, they've sort of purchased the spectrum at auction, but. I think the statute still says that you can't focus just exclusively on maximizing profits. I don't, I mean, not maximizing profits, but maximizing auction revenues. I don't know if that changed uh, from the, the, the uh, incentive auctions bill. I don't think it did. Uh, so there's still a, a role for uh, applying public interest obligations beyond just, uh, you know, auction, uh, you know, making an entity pay for the, re the privilege to use exclusive spectrum. Did anybody else want to take a... Uh uh, shot at that. Hmm. Um, I think that, like I, I mentioned a little bit before, with universal service, um, the FCC definitely opened the door to start to think about uh, at least um, mobile voice as being considered, you know, part of the necessity, <laughs> uh, the world of necessary communications, and um, and. And now that the FCC is taking steps towards broadband, I think it starts to muddy it even further because um, there are wireless providers that are trying to get involved in providing that broadband that the FCC is seeking to deploy across the country. Um, and what, what kind of broadband do you get from a wireless provider um, versus from today's broadband providers? So I think, you know, instead of, I think we're, we're at a moment where we're starting to see um, the distinctions between wireline and wireless starting to maybe even fade, and and we're focused more on what you can achieve through these different conduits, you know, if you want to call them conduits. But um, because at the end, I think what Amalia is getting at is, you know, what's the goal of utilizing these devices? What's the goal of of putting out these networks or having these technologies ubiquitous? And if the goal is to have people have access to each other, have access to healthcare, have access to education, access to jobs, then we're going to have to treat both wireline and wireless with more of a public interest obligations eye. 
Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to do that, at least through universal service and, and with other, through the auctions. And so we, we move away from, from having the public interest hang on the, uh, uh, the scarcity of the license and move back uh, to uh, the idea that when you are engaged in some sort of, you know, certain types of, 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 Im of uh, important public uh, 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 services, uh, which uh, that, uh, that, you know, in the same way that natural gas doesn't depend on scarcity, but the obligation, you know, traditional obligation to serve everybody in your franchise area with a natural gas pipeline uh, uh, was a public interest uh, obligation. That sort of... Uh, um, is that, uh, uh, is that going to be enough to carry us forward, um, do you think? Or is there still going to be, as the FCC itself recognized, when it set up the mobility fund as separate from uh, um, the rest of the Universal Service Fund? Uh, and let me, let me ask this one to Margaret and then Amaya. Um, uh, you know, do you think that uh, um, even if we had a public interest theory, theory of broadband, there'd still be something... Uh, about uh, these uh, spectrum licenses that would have some public interest attachment? Um, well, I, not to avoid your question, Harold, but I wanted to go back to something that mm -hmm. um, I think Amalia was speaking to um, when she was talking about this idea of sort of, you know, leapfrogging for historically unserved or underserved communities, you know, just now being able to reap the benefits of mobility and, and mobile broadband. You know, I, I think that highlights that the challenge is not just about the ubiquitous availability of these networks, but also this huge affordability piece that you're speaking to. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, and, and I think these are the issues that FCC, the FCC is trying to grapple with, you know, the, the programs that we have that you were asking um, Amina about at the beginning of the program, Lifeline and LinkUp, you know, they're born out of a very different regulatory structure that, you know, doesn't necessarily equate with the market and, and technology today. So it's like we still have the same public policy goals, but how do we make these programs, you know, work in the new era? So, um, Amalia, did you want to? Yeah, um, you know, I just wanted to add, I think that, you know, I think one of the ways to drill down when you sort of look at the amount of money that these corporations are making in communities, but particularly really vulnerable communities, we often talk about the co cost of connectivity. And this, this is particularly true when you're working um, with like social service providers, right, who oftentimes are working with homeless adults or people in transitional housing, and they're helping them to make their household budget. You know, and one of the things that we're seeing is that now social service providers are beginning to understand that this internet access point or this mobile phone cost really needs to be included in a household budget. Because just like rent, just like electricity, it is an essential utility for people for all of these things. So when you think about people paying, you know, anywhere between $40 a month upwards of 200 plus for the different mobile phones, for their data plans, for their texting, for all of these things, you start to see the cost of connectivity that individual, individuals and families are bearing. And then you start to look at the profit margins for these corporations. And I think, you know, being someone who comes to this world through organizing, you know, the first place I sort of go with that is, you know, where are the community benefits agreements? You know, how do we talk about, how do we use this language of public interest obligations as a springboard for a larger conversation around an equity agenda? And what does that look like? How do we use this kind of this issue of how much the carriers are making? Because they are making a ton of money and they have been researching our communities and how much we spend for a long time. And they know where the greatest profit margins are. So how do we look at that and then have these conversations about community benefit agreements or community benefit standards? The same way people are forcing liquor stores or gas stations or mini marts in their communities to say, if you're going to do business and you're going to take money out of our pocketbooks, here are some basic expectations we have for how you do business. Those are the same kind of conversations that we need to have at the federal level, but also at the state and local level. You know, and all the way from top to bottom, I think we need to be aligned around some very similar principles. Well, Harold, do you have anything uh, uh, you want to add on any of these? Because uh, I yeah. then want to open it up to uh, questions from the uh, audience. Yeah, I, I, I realize that given the legacy of licensed spectrum, that we have to talk about public interest obligations and we have to hold the big carriers accountable. As Ben said, Verizon and AT&T combined own 70%, control 70% of the licensed spectrum. But I don't want to lose 
us to lose sight of the fact that going forward, there is no economic or social rationale for licensed spectrum. There is no rationale for licensed spectrum. Um, the smart radio technology that's already here and the ability of communities to organize and self-provision broadband, as we've seen with municipal networks, nonprofit community networks like, like the one that I uh, um, uh, run, uh, the, the rural electric cooperatives that are moving into the broadband space. Um, um, what we need is unlicensed spectrum moving forward. Uh, there, the public, whole question of public interest obligation becomes kind of a moot point because if you empower communities to self-provision, the public interest obligations will be um, uh, built into the pie, so to speak. And, and so... Uh, I just don't want us to lose. I know we have to hold accountable the legacy, uh, uh, the carriers that that control the license spectrum today. But moving forward, there is no economic or social rationale for license spectrum in the broadband space. All right, well, let me now open it up to uh, the audience here for uh, for questions. Do we have questions? Uh, uh, one gentleman in the back there. And could you just introduce yourself uh, uh, and uh, who you're with when you uh, start? Uh, hi, my name is Jabari Zakian. I'm with me. Um, <laughs> Good um, one to be with. <laughs> one of the thing, uh, a couple comments. First, I think um, so-called progressive interests and people who are really concerned with uh, public access and public use of of, of uh, technology need to be more vociferous and clear as to what they want to have happen in specific instances because I think part of this whole thing is that corporate interest and private interest have very clear and a very profound sense of the narrative and they control it and basically what people grow up with is with this single narrative that money rules everything and, and, and everything else is just trickle down, right? And it has to be the other way. Uh, the, one of the other things I would just say that the, I think that the use of technology is, if you just start talking about technology, you're going to lose most people because, the, because as Amalia thinks, the, the, the only purpose of technology should be to help people and to make the world better. And the technology itself either should or shouldn't be used based on whether it achieves those goals. Just because you have technology doesn't mean you should use it if it doesn't achieve those goals. Uh, the last thing, I think a very good model from a sense of policy and activism and, <coughs> and actually uh, product, productivity and use of and creation of actual things is the open source model. The open source model, which many people probably here knows, actually created the internet because without Apache, without, without DNS and all these other standards that are open source, there would be no internet as we know it and you wouldn't have any of your stuff. But as long as we think that Apple and, and Microsoft and Google are in Google, which is probably one of the best uh, functional open source uh, companies in the world because all their servers they built themselves and they, use, they run all this stuff off open source. Um, but that model is the basis behind which most of the public service uh, access sh should be based on. It should be based on an open source model, not just from the standards point of view of just software, but there's an open source hardware model now. There's open source developed everything. So, but, but you know, most people here are, pro are probably using closed source uh, things. You're using your Apples, you're using your Microsoft, you're not using Linux, you're not using these things. So there's this contradiction where we talk one thing but we use these products from private entities that control us. And I think we got to live, the, you got to walk, talk, walk the talk that you're trying to promote and I use mean, the, I, the I, I think I, the, you know, there's a lot in that that I think is good and I do want to give folks here a chance to respond but I'll just, uh, one thing though that I did want to take from that is that perhaps there's this idea of a public interest in collaboration um, and this open source model, perhaps that is a new public interest idea that ought to be yeah, uh, embedded in the use of the public airwaves that wasn't possible in the old technology. And let me, let me ask uh, anyone here on the panel, any response to, uh, um, to the uh, statement there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's where unlicensed or we could call it open spectrum comes in. I mean, it really is about 
individuals and communities being able to take advantage of this public resource and, and really creating very uh, low barriers to entry the same way that the internet through open source and open standards allowed anyone to develop a website and become a creator and become you know develop services and so forth. So uh, we can create that in spectrum, I think, through pursuing a much more open spectrum framework, whether that's through un traditional unlicensed, where you have a set aside frequency that that is just available for the public, like we have for Wi-Fi, or it's through the TV white spaces or opportunistic access, where you know spectrum that's being unused, that's been allocated to other purposes, can be used by the public, uh, and then you know. Uh, you can either share it or, you know, it, fill in sort of the gaps. And, and that creates sort of a real opportunity for the public, local communities, new innovators, new entrepreneurs to benefit from that uh, public resource. Yeah, Harold, uh, I think the speaker was uh, describing the infrastructure commons um, that has unleashed all this uh, incredible innovation and, and wealth and, and jobs. And um, going forward, that's, I think we're at a place where, for the first time, really, um, the public airwaves can truly be treated as an infrastructure commons uh, uh, by which small rural communities can self-provision, innovators can innovate, new businesses, new wealth can be created. Great. Let me um, ask now, uh, um, I've got um, uh, you, sir, over there, and then Angela, I know, had her hand up, so we'll take those two, and then we'll see if we have time for any additional questions. Hi, uh, my excuse me. My name is Terry Scott. I am um, independent producer for public television, public radio in my past. So I'm a storyteller, and I'm trying to get my head around this story so I can tell this to my community. So DC has this fiber optic network they're sitting up on, and the public can't get to it yet. But they're selling their services to Comcast and Verizon, who then sell it back to us. How do we explain that? That's, um, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to explain it by that's the subject of a built. different panel, yeah. but, um, but uh, um, I do think that it is in some way perhaps tied into this, this broader question, particularly if we expand this out to uh, broadband and not just wireless. Does anybody uh, uh, want to uh, want to take a shot at that? I, I can comment because we've been looking at it. Um. Well, I think it goes back to Wally's point of an infrastructure commons. I mean, D.C. got that, you know, is building this network. Part of it's being funded by the federal government through BTOP uh, grants. Part of it's being funded by D.C. taxpayers. And so what you have is basically a, a publicly funded build for fiber that where they promised within their grant discussion to, serve, to have all these community benefits. Among the community benefits was serving community anchor institu institutions, uh, nonprofit organizations, so forth, so that there would be a direct benefit from the for the community of this this fiber optic infrastructure. Now, whether they've been meeting that as of recently is not really clear. Uh, many of the community anchor institutions that they stated would be connected have not been connected. Uh, nonprofits are unable to afford the cost of connectivity that they're charging. Um, the they also you know, sort of set this up as sort of a public infrastructure for ISPs as well. And so the, the argument was that other new ISPs could come in and provide service over this infrastructure. The way they've set the fees up and where, where the negotiations have gone, it looks like Verizon and Comcast are the only companies that are going to potentially benefit from leasing capacity on this network, which is profoundly kind of disturbing because those are two companies that A, are enormously profitable, B, this is an enormously profitable community. I mean, it's not like you can't make a business case for building fiber in Washington, D.C. Um, and so the notion that we should have to publicly uh, subsidize them to get higher connectivity in Washington, D.C., which is a major metropolitan area, I think is, is, should be very controversial. Uh, and I don't think it's got quite the attention that it probably should. And I... I'd I'd just like to add this, the, the, the question that you raised here goes to something that Amalia was saying earlier about this problem of uh, if you want to do business in the community, then uh, the community really ought to have a say in setting the rules. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the things that we've seen um, when communities have tried to build um, their own uh, networks uh, is that uh, the providers 
uh, have then come in to uh, uh, get laws passed or otherwise use pressure to prevent uh, those public communities from, quote, competing with the private sector. Although, as we've seen, the private sector is very happy to take advantage of the infrastructure uh, when it's built out. And uh, uh, perhaps one of the things as we're, we're looking at the public interest uh, on this is to, uh, uh, to raise this question of, you know, you're, everybody wants people to do business in the community. You know, the communities are happy to have people come in and do business, but um, come in and do business does not mean, you know, expect to have money thrown at you, charge what you want, and keep anybody else out for the privilege of having you do business. Uh, and that's where uh, uh, maybe yeah, the, the story you're talking about needs to, to raise those uh, questions. Uh, let me get... Uh, Harold, um, I think one key question about this DC fiber uh, network is, could a neighborhood-based nonprofit step up and lease fiber, lease bandwidth from that network and, and become an ISP for that underserved neighborhood? And and in a way linking this back to the actual topic of this panel, and would they use unlicensed spectrum to provide uh, uh, oh, the link to, uh, uh, from uh, the home to the, uh, to the fiber or uh, something else? Uh, right. And let me just get Angela and then uh, uh, I think that'll be all we'll have time for. Thank you, Angela Campbell, Institute for Public Representation. So to the extent that we're trying to identify uh, what public interest means going forward. I like the way we've, uh, the factors we've talked about so far. Amalia um, identified access, affordability, digital literacy, and then we added the open source. Um, but I think there's another thing that should be on that list, and that is privacy protections for the public. I worry not just that the lack of privacy is a deterrence for some people getting uh, access, but I also worry that in promoting universal service, uh, we're unintentionally uh, creating a lot of problems uh, down the road if we don't um, ensure that people can protect their privacy. Um, anybody want to respond uh, to that? Well, yeah, Harold. Um, one of the uh, benefits of a community network is accountability. And one of the things that we, we talk about a lot here in, in Asheville and the mountains of North Carolina is the fact that um, our network is accountable. I mean, you pick up the phone or you come to our office, we have strict privacy protections. We're all about protecting digital civil liberties. And the fact that we are local, we are accountable, people know where we live, uh, you know, we're, we can't take uh, liberties with people's privacy and pers personal information like a big absentee-owned carrier can. Well, you yeah, I just wanted to add quickly to it. I think um, uh, what Angela and what Wally said are important. And I think it raises this sort of final kind of larger point around so long as we don't talk about, um, you know, the sort of the the word that's unspoken, which is power, right? Like in a community setting, if you were an organizer, you would be doing a power analysis about all of this. And you would see that there are carriers, in particular telcos, all of this stuff, who wield disproportionate power. So even if you, you know, when you throw around or kind of band-aid solutions like public-private partnership, you would know that there's nothing inherently equal. No one's starting on common ground. If you talked about public interest obligations, you would know that there are certain portions of the public that were left behind. You, you, you would know all this. And I think if we don't talk about power and we don't talk about the increasing role of private companies in our life and the way that we continue to turn to private corporations to fill um, and fix the social gap and you know, help to alleviate a social safety net that no longer exists, we cannot see clearly that all of these other situations come with it, like privacy being one. Because of course, as the corporations provide these sorts of services to us, they need to incentivize themselves through that process and increase their um, bottom line, which means that they're always treating us as consumers, which means that will dictate the power dynamics in that relationship, which means they want to call information from us, they want to data mine our communities, and they want to use that to develop more high-tech ways of selling these services back to us. So I think it gets to what the earlier speaker was talking about, why we don't know what open access is. I think it raises the question of why Facebook and Twitter and all of these things are a huge issue. I, I just think it's that that um, piece around power and the, and the um, role of corporations. Well, I want to thank you all very much. Um, and uh, I want to say, as uh, 
um, legal director of public knowledge. I, uh, we were very pleased to uh, sponsor this uh, uh, conference um, and uh, um, to, uh, to help uh, with the organization with, uh, um, with uh, both uh, Rutgers and uh, with uh, New America. Uh, all of us, I think, hope that this will be the first of many conversations uh, that we are having uh, inside Washington and outside of Washington. Uh, and now I know that Ellen would just like to uh, yes, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.